So as folks are trickling in, uh, we can kind of set the table here. I'm Hassan El Tayeb. I'm FCNL's lead Middle East policy lobbyist. And uh, we're going to have a discussion on the one year anniversary of Biden's Yemen announcement. And today we're joined by, uh, you know, a great group of panelists, including Aisha Juman, the president of Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, Bruce Rydell from the Brookings Institute, Anel Shaleen from the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, and Marcus Stanley uh, from Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Um, our panel discussion is called, is called The War in Yemen, One Year into the Biden Administration. So one year after the Biden administration announced an end to U.S. support for the Saudi-led coalition's war uh, in Yemen, critical forms of U.S. military aid remains, including ongoing spare parts and maintenance uh, for Saudi warplanes that are engaged in operations over Yemen. Uh, we are fast approaching the seven-year anniversary of this war in March, and it seems like things on the ground are escalating, not de-escalating with, uh, you know, increased air raids by the Saudi-led coalition. Uh, we've got the Saudi blockade is still in place, blocking flights from Sana Airport, uh, blocking fuel deliveries from getting through Red Sea ports. And this event is a chance to reflect on one year of the Biden administration's policy and look at steps that Congress can take to end the crisis um, we are going to invite uh, Aisha Juman to be our first speaker. Um, you may have seen Aisha at past panels that we've done or see, seeing her other work. But Dr. Aisha Juman is the president of Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation and has over 30 years of experience in public health, including viral vaccine pre preventable diseases, child health and nutrition, primary health care and women in development. And she's currently working as an independent consultant coordinating health related projects in Yemen. Uh, Aisha Juman, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm going to ask you a few questions and would love to get your take on the, the humanitarian situation in Yemen and some commonly misunderstood narratives about the crisis. So you recently published an op-ed that sought to deconstruct some of the commonly repeated narratives about the Yemen war. And with that in mind, I really want to know what should Congress know about Yemen that's not getting through to the U.S. media? What is the media getting wrong about what prompted the recent escalation that we've seen between, you know, Saudi airstrikes, uh, you know, Houthi drone attacks? Um, and can you also paint a picture of the humanitarian situation on the ground right now, one year into the Biden administration? Uh, and what you know, how would you grade the administration's approach over the past year? I'll let you take it. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, and thank you, everybody on the panel. And thank you to the listeners as well for being with us today. So um, in terms of what's happening in Yemen, as uh, it was in Yemen, September, October of this year, um, and I was in Aden when uh, they blew up the airport. Um, and I was leaving actually at six in the morning and they blew it. Uh, they bring you up there for the night before. So what does the US media not report about what's going on in Yemen? Uh, one is that the government in Sana'a, and actually the USAID refers to the government in Sana'a as the Sana'a-based authorities. Uh, yet in all the media reporting, it's always uh, the Houthis, uh, which is actually inaccurate because it is a coalition of many parties in Yemen who are against the Saudi-led coalition uh, war in Yemen. So it's actually wrong to call it the Houthi. It is led by Ansar Allah, um, but it does include multiple uh, Yemeni parties, political parties in the government. The other thing that also is not reported and a lot of people don't recognize is that Sana'a government um, controls, you know, 80% of the Yemeni population about live in the Sana'a um, control, the Sana'a government control. And that is because many people also are leaving uh, unsafe places, uh, like Aden, for example, which is quite unfortunate uh, that it is unsafe and moving to areas uh, that are under the control of the Sana'a government. 
also, uh, which was also surprising to me, is some of the services were starting to be repaired. For example, electricity, um, water, and the internet services had improved uh, from the initial damage that was caused by uh, the coalition airstrikes. And however, we see that uh, the coalition continues to damage a lot of these services as um, in their recent escalation, they have um, targeted communication towers. Uh, we also all heard about the reports of targeting the gate uh, to Yemen for the internet, and that is in Hodeida. Uh, so there is, uh, and the other thing also is the exchange rate. And there's been a lot of publication on that. The exchange rate for the Yemeni real in the Sana'a control areas is about 600 per US dollars. It's about 1,200 in uh, the areas controlled by the internationally uh, recognized government. So food prices have just doubled in those areas, making uh, hunger is act actually worse. And if you look at recent UN reports, uh, they indicate that 45% of the people under uh, the inter internationally recognized government are uh, food insecure secure um, compared to 35% in the areas under the Sana'a government. So these are some of the issues that uh, we don't hear about uh, in the US media. I think the other thing is this insistence on calling um, Iran every time they talk about uh, Ansar Allah or the Sana'a government. You know, there've been a lot of reports and Bruce had written about this as well. Uh, that actually the war has made the Sana'a government closer to Iran and not the other way around. Uh, so the escalation of violence and the war in Yemen has made the relationship closer, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that they actually um, obey any directions that come from Iran. And, and I think that is extremely clear. Uh, and anybody who knows about foreign policy would, would uh, say that. So that's in terms of the misrepresentation of the US media on what's happening in Yemen. In terms of um, about what, in terms of the recent escalation, a lot of people start with the Houthi or the Ansar uh, attack in the UAE, but that's not when the escalation started. The escalation started when the UN decided to um, stop the investigation of war crimes in Yemen. And this was prompted by the Saudi, who actually worked very hard and lobbied very hard to end any investigation into war crimes in Yemen. And we've heard and read uh, about how they uh, lobbied and actually intimidated the government in, in, of Indonesia into voting to end the war investigation, uh, war crimes investigation in Yemen by threatening in Indonesia that they would not allow people from Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, to go to Hajj. So they have now are using uh, Islamic uh, holy places to intimidate uh, other Muslim countries. And of course, they gave money to other countries. So why are the Saudis afraid of war crimes investigation in Yemen? So once that investigation, uh, you know, war crime investigation tribunal or, or uh, body was dismantled and uh, voted to not continue, that's when the escalation started. So from December, um, my family is in Yemen, uh, everybody I know, and, um, you know, given the tribal structure of Yemeni uh, culture, I know a lot of people who are related to me one way or another. Um, and I, every night um, I hear about all the airstrikes that had started um, again in December have continued. And if you look at the uh, Yemen uh, data project, you'll see a spike in airstrikes uh, in Yemen uh, on, on the capital in Sana'a. And most of the time they target neighborhoods. Um, I know of at least six hospitals that had been affected by the recent uh, airstrikes. The Ministry of Health um, also has been affected. The only prosthetic center in, in Sana'a and giving a war and a lot of uh, people have lost their limbs uh, also had been affected by the airstrikes, the radio uh, uh, station, the TV station. So a lot of their targets are civilian uh, targets and civilian infrastructure. What's also very troublesome is that now they are also back into 
targeting very crowded areas. So when they targeted a Zubairi uh, street, which is like, you can't even walk in that street because it's so crowded. That's where a lot of businesses, small businesses are, pops and moms shops there. Uh, they've targeted, uh, the, it, it's, it, they've been more emboldened to target areas that are quite, quite crowded. They've targeted the Sabine, which is also where the only maternity, large maternity hospital exists. Uh, again, damaging this hospital, and they, they have damaged it before. So a lot of what we are hearing about the escalation, it's actually started with the Saudi and the UAE. It, and um, if you read um, all the, the reports that are coming out of Sana'a, you would see that a lot of it saying, this is, you know, we're doing this, and, and especially uh, the attack on the UAE, because the UAE is back engaged in, in, in the war in Yemen. So these are some of the issues that I want people to be aware of um, and, and understand that this is not a one-way street. The Yemeni have been under bombing for seven years. That's over 2,500 days of a, a daily bombardment and daily airstrikes. Uh, so when we hear about, you know, even if it's in the hundreds of airstrikes or, or uh, targeting the Saudi or the UAE, that's just a drop in a bucket of what the Yemeni um, everyday feel uh, and see. In terms of uh, the humanitarian crisis, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard, uh, WFP had decided to drop, drop a few millions in Yemen uh, from their list of food distribution. Uh, there are 16.2 million people in Yemen who are in need of aid uh, or, or at risk of famine. That hasn't changed, uh, and every year it gets even worse. Uh, I've seen whole families, which is really heartbreaking, uh, living in the streets. Uh, we have about 4 million Yemeni who are internally displaced. Uh, and because you know they have nowhere else to go, they have no way of getting out of Yemen. As we all know, the uh, blockade on Yemen uh, has made it very difficult, not just for food entry and fuel entry, and we know right now that in terms of fuel, uh, there are eight ships that are being held in Jezan in Saudi Arabia, not allowed to get into Yemen. Uh, fuel prices are quite high. Uh, so there is a lot of suffering that is going on. A lot of the health services will have to be sh shut down because of the lack of fuel. Uh, and, and the reason people not, cannot get out of Yemen is because Yemen is under a blockade. Where can they go? Uh, the, Two countries that border Yemen are Saudi Arabia and uh, Oman. Uh, they cannot get to Saudi Arabia, of course, as we know, and Oman is not also allowing refugees in. So sometimes it's that uh, exodus of refugee that gets attention. Uh, and because in Yemen, we don't see that exodus. People don't recognize that there is so much suffering um, in, in the country. Uh, we've heard also that, you know, over 300,000 Yemeni people have been killed, mostly uh, by indirect causes and a, a public health professional. I can vouch that actually the number would be three times that uh, estimate. Uh, I'm sure it's over a million people because we know the health services are only available. You know, 50 percent of the health services are available. So who is recording those who are dying in their homes because they are they don't have enough to eat. Who is recording uh, a measles case? Who dies in their home because there are no health services around? We know that diphtheria has not been a problem in Yemen since the 1980s. And now we've seen diphtheria springing up everywhere. Measles is springing up everywhere. Um, we know that cholera was the largest reported um, you know, uh, outbreak in, in the world with over 2 million cases. So a lot of these, uh, this situation for the Yemeni population are the, are, are the direct result of the airstrikes on the infrastructure and also the blockade uh, on Yemen. If you actually look at the UNVM, which is the UN verification uh, mechanism, and you look at how many ships used to go to Yemen and how many ships are allowed today, uh, in the beginning of 2016, there were about uh, 40,000 ships uh, that were 
would get into Hodeida. Today, we are about 1,000 ships, and most of these are UN ships. Uh, so again, it's a destruction of the economy, uh, making it very difficult for people to find even one meal a day. Uh, going back to your question about how would I rate uh, the Biden administration's Yemen approach, um, if there is a, any grade less than F, which is failed, I would actually grade them on that. The, this administration has not just uh, failed in everything that they promised that they are gonna do. The credibility of the US is almost non-existent. When I was in Yemen talking to ordinary people, uh, everybody will tell you that they, do, they actually consider the US as part of the Saudi-led coalition. They do not mediator, they do not consider it an honest broker. And every time we hear a strike um, in Yemen, uh, for example, the strike that hit the detention center with you know, about 91 uh, innocent people killed and over 200 injured, we didn't hear one condemnation from this administration. Yet um, any, any strike against the UAE or uh, Saudi Arabia, we hear uh, you know, so many condemnation. So the people in Yemen hear that and are affected by that. And uh, unless the US is serious about uh, not having this, the, this disaster that they um, helped establish with the Obama administration when Biden was, was vice president, uh, unless they are serious about ending it, this is something that would definitely affect uh, the Biden administration and will also be one of the legacies uh, of President Biden that he helped start a war. And when he had a second chance to do something about it, he escalated it. So I'll stop here uh, and thank you very much for listening. Aisha, thank you so much. It's a heartbreaking scenario you laid out, but uh, always appreciate your analysis, insight, and your friendship. Um, we're going to go to Bruce Rydell, uh, Brookings Fellow. Uh, he is a senior fellow and director of the Brookings Intelligence Project, part of Brookings Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. In addition, Rydell serves as a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy. He retired in 2006 after 30 years of service at the CIA, including postings overseas. He was a senior advisor on South Asia and the Middle East to four presidents of the United States in the staff of the National Security Council at the White House. He was also a deputy assistant secretary of defense for Near East and South Asia at the Pentagon and a senior advisor at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in Brussels. We are always pleased to have you on with us, Bruce. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the U.S. role. When the Biden administration came into office, they said they're going to end U.S. support for offensive operations. They didn't really de define offensive or defensive. We later learned that maintenance and spare parts was ongoing. They proceeded to sell over a billion dollars of weapons, um, you, know, you know, attack helicopters, air-to-air -air munitions. We just saw a another sale announced this week. Uh, we also hear that the Biden administration is considering an FTO designation, a foreign terrorist organization designation that they originally lifted uh, that Trump had put in place for fear of the impacts on humanitarian access and, and the impacts on what it would do to the negotiation process. You've written in the past, uh, well, you've written extensively on this issue, but in the past you've also said that the blockade is an offensive operation that blockades cannot be defensive they're offensive operations and therefore u.s involvement should have ended following biden's declaration in february you know with all that in mind i'd like to hear how you would grade the biden administration's uh you know a policy approach to yemen in the past year what do we know about ongoing support uh, you know, what, what's still ongoing and how is that all impacting, you know, the, the blockade, the prospects for a negotiated settlement? And uh, with that, I'll just I'll let you take it. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I'll give my bottom line up front. I agree completely with Aisha. Uh, the Biden record is an F minus. If there was something less than that, we could I would give less than that. Uh, the facts on the ground speak for themselves. Uh, there is no end 
uh, to the war. Uh, that's what Biden promised he was going to work for a year ago, a, sure, a quick end to the war. Uh, we haven't seen the quick end to the war. Uh, and as um, both of you uh, have, have already demonstrated, uh, to the contrary, uh, the war is escalating today. Uh, and it may be moving towards a, a much more dangerous phase uh, in escalation. Um, I'll let Anel speak to that uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, overall, if you look at American policy towards Yemen and towards the war, I find it very hard to differentiate where we are today from where we were in the four years of the Trump administration or where we were in the year of the Obama administration. Uh, American supplies, spare parts, uh, expertise, technicians, all that continues to flow uh, to the Royal Saudi Air Force, uh, to the Royal uh, Saudi Land Forces, uh, to the National Guard. Uh, there really is no perceptible change there. Uh, arms sales continue. Um, the, the, the blockade continues uh, with de facto American support behind it. Um, it there really is uh, virtually no discernible difference. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to say what offensive military action uh, the United States has ceased supporting. Um, it certainly uh, continues to support the Royal Saudi Air Force's air campaign against targets in Yemen. Uh, why is this? Well, first of all, I think a big part is that contrary to what Biden said a year ago, uh, this is not a top priority. Uh, we haven't seen the Secretary of State get involved in trying to terminate the war. Um, we have not seen um, the National Security Advisor deeply involved in this, although he did go to he did go to Riyadh and he did meet with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Um, we just haven't seen uh, the kind of high level uh, Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, attention devoted to this ending this conflict uh, that seemed to be in the cards a, a year ago uh, when the president made his announcements. Now his special advisor for um, Yemen uh, does travel extensively in the region uh, and that's all to the good, um, but I don't see much coming from all of that so far. Uh, instead, what I see coming uh, and Aisha made note of this too, is uh, increasingly baiting the Houthis. Uh, the Houthis are, are, are denounced every time uh, they carry out a military operation in Saudi Arabia or the UAE. Whereas when the Saudis carry out a military operation in Yemen, the United States is quiet about it. Um, and this is becoming more and more uh, frequent. Uh, and the attacks uh, on the Houthis actions uh, are becoming more and more shrill. Now you raised the question of uh, designating the, the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization. Um, this is a, a remarkable change for the Biden administration. Uh, they came in and immediately undid the last minute Trump designation of the Houthis as an FTO. And at the time they were absolutely right. They made all the right arguments that designating the Houthis as an FTO will make it virtually impossible for non-governmental organizations to provide humanitarian aid to the Yemeni people in those parts of Yemen, which are under the control of the um, Sana'a government. Uh, and as Aisha pointed out, that means 80% of the people of the country would not be getting any kind of assistance. Um, I would hope that the administration will remember its, its own arguments. And certainly I would hope that those on the Hill who pushed against this uh, in the closing days of the Trump administration would make clear to the administration that they would not be supportive of uh, going on like that. Um, it's clear too that the administration has other priorities that matter much more than Yemen. Uh, Iran, for example, uh, clearly is a much higher priority uh, in, in many respects, uh, especially in seeking to get a revival of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, that is by far 
uh, a higher priority uh, for the administration's Middle East policy uh, than uh, dealing with ending the war in Yemen. Uh, and counterterrorism uh, is a higher policy uh, than dealing with the counterterrorism. Counterterrorism is especially important to the administration uh, after the fiasco of its withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, and I think there was a, a, no accident that the administration is trying to put a lot of attention on the death of Abu Ibrahim al uh, Hashim al Qureshi, the head letter of, leader of ISIS, uh, yesterday to show that uh, it uh, continues to prioritize the war on, uh, uh, against uh, ISIS. Uh, I have no problem with supporting uh, getting back to the JCPOA, uh, leaving it was a terrible mistake. Um, and of course, I support counterterrorism operations. But that doesn't, shouldn't mean that Yemen doesn't get the priority attention that it deserves. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, that is what has happened. Uh, I'm also very much fearful um, for the day, which I think is coming this before, before spring, uh, when the administration says that the JCPOA cannot be recovered uh, and it moves towards some kind of a new, more uh, belligerent policy towards Iran, which I think will have unfortunate uh, side effects uh, for policy towards Yemen. Um, the administration has done nothing in terms of getting a new uh, United Nations Security Council resolution. Um, this is a badly needed change. Uh, the existing United Nations Security Council resolution, which of course dates back to the Obama administration, is tilted entirely in favor of the Saudis. Uh, it more or less provides the legal legitimacy to the blockade, although I would argue that it, 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 it should not be interpreted that way, but the Saudis interpret it that way, and the United States has never quarreled with that interpretation. Um, we need a new UN Security Council resolution that is much more balanced, uh, that uh, seeks to uh, especially focus on ending foreign interference in Yemen. Uh, it, it may be a bridge too far at this point to get a political settlement among the warring Yemeni parties. Maybe we should focus instead on getting an agreement that keeps foreign governments, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Iran, on any of them from providing uh, military assistance to any party in Yemen. Uh, in order to do that, the existing United Nations verification inspection mechanism, UNVIM, uh, could be bolstered and expanded considerably uh, to focus not just on preventing Iranian equipment and technical support from getting in, but to focus on preventing all kinds of foreign activity, except for humanitarian assistance that goes to the uh, um, help of the um, uh, Yemeni people, uh, which as Aisha has just laid out to us, are an urgent need of that kind of support. So I will stop there and um, we can proceed on. Bruce, always really appreciate your analysis and your writing. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, uh, we're going to go to Anel next. Um, Dr. Shaleen is a research fellow in the, in the Middle East program at the Quincy Institute and an expert on religious and political authority in the Middle East and North Africa. She was previously a Zwan postdoctoral fellow at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Prior to beginning her PhD, she worked as a journalist in Egypt and Yemen. She's done field work and research in Saudi, uh, Yemen, Oman, Qatar, the UAE, Jordan, Morocco, and Egypt, and has an advanced proficiency in Arabic, French, and Spanish. Shaleen, uh, Anel Shaleen, thank you so much for being here with us today. We'd really like to get your thoughts on the geopolitical context that we find ourselves in right now. Um, you know, there's been a really heartbreaking few weeks for so many of us who've been following this closely with recent escalations of civilian casualties. Uh, and so often it's the civilians that are paying, you know, paying the price to this ongoing conflict. 
Uh, what can you tell us about the state of the war right now uh, in li light of recent airstrikes by Saudi, stepped up involvement by the United Arab Emirates, uh, Houthi drone attacks, and the consideration of an FTO designation? And how would you grade the Biden administration's uh, one-year uh, policy on Yemen? Hassan, thanks so much for that kind introduction and, and to my fellow panelists um, and to all of you for being here to listen. Uh, we last had the, the same group of us actually doing a similar event prior um, to the recent vote to try to block the sale of um, US air-to-air -air missiles to Saudi Arabia. We know probably those um, interested enough to be on the call might remember that those were, were characterized as defensive weapons, which is why the Biden administration said um, it was going to go ahead and allow the sale through. Um, and what we've seen since then is this escalation, as Aisha was mentioning, the, the um, ballooning level of airstrikes we've observed in December and in January. Um, got some attention. Of course, nothing got as much attention as the the handful of Houthi drone and missile attacks own, uh, aimed at the UAE. Um, unfortunately, there were three individuals killed. Um, subsequent attacks were mostly deflected. We know that, that um, U.S. Patriot missile systems were deployed to protect U.S. soldiers stationed at Adafra Air Force Base in the UAE. Um, and and this, this is quite unfortunate, but I think it's just important to keep in mind the scale of what we're talking about here. So three or four attacks aimed at the UAE as opposed to the, the <laughs> just daily attacks um, aimed by the Saudi coalition at Yemen hitting civilian targets. Um, for example, the, the Saudi coalition airstrike that hit a detention facility in Saada that killed close to 100 people. Uh, around that time, Saudi airstrikes also knocked out Yemen's internet for several days, which was immediately devastating because so many Yemenis do rely on family abroad to send money in, um, or they either sending money or sending um, just assistance that comes in usually online. Um, and so by having the, the internet um, down for a few days, it gave a little bit of a sense of what would happen if this FTO designation were in fact reinstated, because this would make any sort of you know, private business commercial interests attempts to sell any kind of food inside of Yemen or try to conduct financial transactions into Houthi controlled territory, which again is where 80% of Yemen's um, 30 million people live. So approximately 25 million people live under the control of the Houthis. This is who would be affected by this FTO designation because suddenly, even if there were humanitarian um, workarounds or, or exceptions put in place, we know from experience what we've seen in Iran, what we've seen in other countries, um, that commercial um, entities are unwilling to sort of test the limits here. And so even if perhaps it would be allowed for someone to say, a family member to send money to their family member because there would have been an exception made for that, we know that the bank that would authorize that would probably say, sorry, we're, we're just not comfortable um, sending any kind of money to Yemen now that the, the, the controlling entity, the Houthis are placed under an FTO designation. So on the one hand, we've been hearing a lot of these humanitarian organizations saying that they will not be able to conduct their, their they will not be able to operate, which was obviously the concern over a year ago when Trump did designate the, the Houthis a foreign terrorist organization. And we had a lot of concern about what this would do. Um, but I do think it's important to keep in mind that this would go far beyond um, just the distribution of aid. I mean, this would just completely cripple any attempt for a legitimate economy in Yemen. This is also something that the, the new um, UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Hans um, Grunberg, has brought up in terms of needing to address the, the economic concerns in Yemen, that because the, those who have the guns continue to benefit from the war, they really have no incentive to stop fighting. So this is all sides, you know, the, on the Houthi side, on the various militia groups, 
the Saudis and Emiratis are, are pleased that the US continues to offer this same sort of unconditional support. Again, going back to this notion that the US says we're only providing defensive support when what we've observed is by continuing to simply sell weapons, the US is signaling to the Saudis and Emiratis that the US supports what they're doing in Yemen. Um, and we've already sold both of these entities so many billions of dollars of weapons in the past. I mean, they have plenty of ammunition to, to aim at the Houthis without us needing to, to authorize new sales um, for, for so-called offensive weapons. But the, the point is that they are already extremely well armed and able to, to conduct this, this war, which is devastating Yemen. Um, uh, I, I'm just uh, apologies for, for getting a little breathless here. I think there's, it's just so frustrating to know that at this point, the administration is very seriously considering reimposing this um, foreign terrorist designation on the Houthis, that this is what the UAE has requested. We know this is what the Saudis would like as well. And that this would not only would this be devastating from a humanitarian side, but it would it would just not be good or strategic policy because this would allow the Houthis to shift blame, and they are very much to blame for for all the horrific things that they that they have done. I mean, the Houthis are not good guys. Um, but the point is that if the U.S. reimposes this designation and shuts down all the aid and shuts down the ability of of importers or any kind of money or just completely strain, um, chokes Yemen's already um, quite decimated economy, the Houthis will be able to shift all that blame to the United States. And Yemen was already a source of, of terrorist attacks in the past. Um, furthermore, the longer the war goes on, the more we have to worry about these ungoverned spaces where Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula could potentially reconvene and you'd have an entire population who view the United States as this primary aggressor here, not only enabling the, the Saudi aggression, the Emirati aggression, selling them the weapons, but then directly being involved, creating this these conditions um, for, for even more starvation and deaths of Yemenis. Um, it would also help the Houthis bolster their own credibility because part of their whole narrative is about how they're helping Yemen to defend itself um, from this foreign aggression, including American aggression. So all that to say, I, I would grade the, the Biden administration, yes, as, as kind of less than an F, um, that it was really disappointing when they came in and it seemed like they really were gonna try to emphasize diplomacy here, but instead what we've seen is just this continued unconditional support for what the Saudi-led coalition is doing in Yemen. And instead, what we need, what, what is really necessary is for Congress to step up and um, do to, to redo a war powers resolution. This had already passed Congress back in 2019. It was vetoed by Trump. Um, but this, this is really one of the, the only paths left. We have tried numerous other legislative paths that have not been successful. Um, and clearly we can't count on the Biden administration. I'll turn now to my colleague, Marcus, uh, who's much more of an expert on, on the congressional side than I. Um, but happy to, to take questions, please. If, if people have questions that we're not addressing, just put them in the Q&A. And Nell, thank you so much for speaking to us today and for all of your expert analysis. You've been writing so many awesome pieces. I share your frustration on, on a lot of this stuff, um, but it's really important that we keep engaging and not give up, make sure that we have uh, members of Congress engaged on this in particular. That's why I think this conversation is so important today. And with that, I will turn to Marcus, uh, an another one of, uh, you know, my favorite people in the advocacy world. Uh, he's the advocacy director of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. And prior to joining Quincy, he spent 
a decade at Americans for Financial Reform, where he helped direct the efforts of a coalition of 200 organizations on a range of legislative and regulatory initiatives to challenge the power of Wall Street. Before that, he was an economic policy uh, uh, advisor to uh, Senator Barbara Boxer and a senior economist at the U.S. Joint Economic Committee. Uh, while there, he produced War at Any Price, a seminal study on the full cost of the Iraq invasion, uh, used to build political support to end the U.S. role in the war. Marcus, uh, welcome. Uh, we, you know, having this conversation after hearing Aisha, Bruce, Anel, it seems like there really is, uh, you know, a growing consensus among a lot of people that Congress does need to take action. Uh, you know, how would you grade the Biden administration's Yemen approach? Can you summarize the congressional response that we saw, you know, in Biden's first year in office? I mean, I know there were a lot of statements. There were several votes. I'd love for you to take us through, um, you know, and we've also, you know, been talking here today about a new Yemen war powers resolution. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on all this. And um, yeah, please join us. You can turn on your video. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, and and thank you for putting together this uh, this panel and to everyone for attending. Um, Marcus, could you turn on your video if that's okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so, so you know, there, there's that old saying that uh, the definition of insanity is to continue to do the same things you did before, but expect a different result. And I think we're we're sort of approaching that point with Congress because, in fact. Congress has been, uh, I would say, pretty active on this issue uh, over this year. Uh, we've seen almost a half a dozen major letters, I think five, uh, from all sorts of, of members, one of which got over 100 members uh, from, from the House, uh, from Debbie Dingell and uh, Ted Deutsch, who's a very influential member uh, from the Senate, from Senator Warren. Uh, we've seen legislation being put into the NDA that would uh, definitive that would have definitively cut off uh, US support for Saudi airstrikes uh, within Yemen. Uh, and uh, you know we're still moving backwards. That's the whole thrust of this uh, of this panel is that the Biden administration, uh, despite its promises, despite this congressional activity, is still moving backwards. that that, uh, in, in terms of what's actually happening in Yemen, in the in terms of the escalation of the war, what's happening on the ground, the humanitarian crisis, we're moving backwards. And uh, that uh, legislation that passed into the, that, that uh, was placed in the NDA was unceremoniously stripped uh, in the conference process on the NDA, which I think says something about the limits of sort of a conventional legislative approach here. Uh, so, so really, uh, Congress has to turn up uh, the heat uh, because uh, we're, we're we're not only stalled, uh, we're in reverse. Um, and the the most effective way for Congress to do that is to bring a uh, a privileged war powers resolution to the floor, something that uh, can't be stopped. That. Uh, can't be so where the vote can't be delayed, where it can't be stripped out in Congress. Uh, sorry, sorry, where it can't be stripped out in conference. Uh, a war powers resolution that would force a vote, uh, force a confrontation on this, and force the administration to uh, either uh, defend its actions, uh, which have led to escalation of the war, uh, or to change its policies. Uh, and and that is the way I think that Congress can can force action here, uh, because uh, the root of of uh, you know polite letters to the administration and um, conventional pieces of of legislation uh, has not worked. And you you know in that um, context, I would raise you know we just had the announcement of uh, another piece of of legislation being put forward by. Uh, Representative Malinowski, uh, and I'm I'm glad he's decided to be active in this area. But I would I would say that uh, legislation like that is really not a substitute uh, for a war powers resolution, because from what we know, there there was a Washington Post article this morning 
from what we know about the Malinowski legislation, it appears that it's uh, not as strong as what was put into the NDAA. And it's unclear what the route to rapid passage of this legislation would be. Uh, I mean, again, you know, I, I would stand corrected because I haven't seen the, the final version of the bill, but, for, but from what was reported in the Washington Post, uh, that bill would permit, uh, it, it would state that, that um, the U.S. would have to stop maintenance work for Saudi aircraft uh, on the condition, but only on the condition that those aircraft uh, are used, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, 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 it would, uh, it would stop maintenance work for, for Saudi aircraft doing strikes in Yemen, but it would permit continued maintenance work and continued strikes on the condition that those strikes were used to target Houthi missile and drone capa uh, capacity. And we've already seen the Saudis saying that strikes on Sana'a, strikes on Sana'a airfield, strikes that uh, almost certainly killed civilians were excused by targeting drone capability. And that's not something that we can verify. Uh, so it would permit this significant loophole and it would also permit um, Biden the ability to waive these restrictions on a case by case basis. So those are very significant loopholes that wouldn't exist in a war powers resolution. Um, and again, as I said, it's unclear how this legislation would, would be passed into law because it doesn't have the privileged status of a, a war powers resolution. So I, I know that we've we've gone on uh, you, you know we've we've gone on for a while in this this panel and I, I want to wrap it up, but I just want to say uh, two other things uh, before I close. Um, there, there are so many advantages to a war powers resolution in terms of being able to uh, force the issue and force the question and force a vote on this. Uh, there have been, uh, people have raised questions about uh, whether US actions in keeping Saudi, uh, Saudi planes in the air, the, the maintenance work we do, that keeps Saudi planes in the air and keeps Saudi planes capable of making these airstrikes, whether that falls under uh, the authority of a war's powers resolution. Well, the just by the, the plain text of the, the war powers resolution, these resolutions cover any case in which the United States commands, coordinates, participates in the movement of or accompanies uh, military forces of a foreign government when such forces are engaged in hostilities. I would say keeping the Saudi Air Force in the air uh, counts as participating in their movement because they they couldn't move without us. So that's, that's participating in the movement. Um, and the second thing uh, I would just say in, in closing is this, this issue of, um, of restoring uh, of designating the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization is very pernicious. It's something that, again, would keep us going in reverse. Uh, it's important to oppose for humanitarian reasons and for diplomatic reasons. And I do think this is a case where a congressional letter or uh, folks from Congress raising their voice is important because we've already seen a letter from uh, Seth Moulton supporting this policy. Uh, and I think it's important for people to raise their voices against it. So uh, with that, I will uh, we'll conclude and we can open for questions. Marcus, always appreciate your feedback and analysis on this devastating issue. Uh, maybe I'm just going to invite all the panelists to uh, you know turn their cameras on and we can kind of go into a Q&A session. Um, and I do encourage people that are watching uh, over Zoom to to insert questions in the Q and A function, uh, so we can you know continue the conversation. I also know that Marcus and Aisha have to leave first, uh, so maybe we can direct questions there. Um, there is one uh, I think Marcus might be able to answer. The weapon sales announced to UAE and Saudi this week. 
Um, you know, are those strictly defensive in nature? And I'll just add on to it. You know, is this a political signal to, uh, you know, to Saudi and the UAE that they can continue uh, the, the, you know, the war on the path it's on now? Well, I think we saw with the weapon sales that happened uh, a couple of months ago to Saudi Arabia, which were were certainly certainly not uh, uh, exclusively uh, defensive weapons, uh, that um, that these these weapon sales, you know, a- after those weapon sales, we saw escalation on the part of Saudi Arabia. So, I don't think um, uh, I, I think that weapon sales send uh, absolutely. Uh, the wrong message. Um, you, you, you know, these. Uh, to, to be totally honest about it, I think uh, uh, it might be better directed to Bruce in terms of the specifics of whether these uh, supposed air defense uh, systems are actually exclusively defensive. Uh, I'm not an expert on that uh, on that issue. Yeah, Bruce, would you like to take a stab at it? As far as I understand. Uh, they are classifying them as defensive in nature, but uh, I would love for you to say more, if you can. Certainly. Um, the whole concept of offensive and defensive weapon systems uh, is, to me, profoundly uh, mistaken. Um, a weapon system uh, it, it can be used offensively and defensively. Uh, it, it's not inherent in the weapon system which choice it is. Uh, an air-to-air missile can be used to shoot down an airplane um, delivering supplies to uh, Sana'a, for example. Uh, if, the, if the Houthi uh, alliance had an air force, uh, then air-to-air missiles would be an offensive weapon against that. Now, it is true that when you use them uh, to try to shoot down a drone. Um, arguably, you could say that's a defensive purpose. Um, but I, I think that this, the whole paradigm that the Biden administration introduced of offense and defensive doesn't take us anywhere. Yeah, and uh, if, I could just, ha- if, if I could just add to that for a second, it's a, it's a crucial issue in, in legislation that's advanced to stop this, because what one thing that we've seen, uh, and again, I, I haven't seen the Malinowski legislation, but uh, at least as reported, it was restricted to the the cutoff in support was restricted to offensive uh, strikes, and uh, to to me, you know, a Saudi strike in Yemen is offensive, sort of by definition. Um, and we 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 saw we saw this also in some of the amendments put forward to the NDAA, and it's important in a war powers resolution that it cut off support for all strikes within Yemen. I completely agree. Uh, I think this offensive defensive paradigm uh, has taken us nowhere. Uh, I can't recall an instance in which we made this kind of uh, designation in the past. Um, And last thing I would say is we are now at a point where this conflict could escalate much worse than we've seen before. Uh, the United States is now putting F-35s in the UAE. It's brought the USS Cole um, to Abu Dhabi. Uh, the French are increasing their participation. Uh, there is widespread talk in Israel of the Iron Dome system being sent to Abu Dhabi. Uh, we're talking about bringing in more outside players uh, and the United States directly participating in a military operation in Abu Dhabi. Um, we need to stop this before it gets completely out of hand. Thank you both for that. Um, that's really helpful analysis on that. I want to turn to Aisha uh, for a question that I got um, privately in the chat. Uh, could you tell us more about the FTO designation? Uh, you know the possibility of that. You are you know you do critical humanitarian aid work. So I want to know how this would impact you, Aisha, and and Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. Thank you, Hassan. I, I just want to remind people that when Pompeo uh, decided to make the FTO designation, they made it at the last hour. And the idea was that they were trying to make it more difficult for the Biden administration coming in. So even the Trump administration did not do it 
under their watch. They plan to do it and make it difficult for the Biden administration. So I hope that the Biden administration and, and the people hearing us today recognize that too. In terms of working in Yemen, it is already difficult. Uh, Yemen is uh, sending any money to Yemen, even now. We have to jump through some, so many hoops. Uh, we cannot send US dollars to Yemen, and I don't know where, where that's coming from. Uh, very, very few banks are, um, work as mediatory banks to when you try to send money to Yemen. We have to provide so many documents to our bank here and the bank in Yemen that received the funds on how that funds, these funds are going to be used. So as it is, we have a very challenging environment. And if, if the designation, and even for shipping to Yemen today, I have ultrasounds machines that are handholds, been sitting in my home for a year, have not been able to ship to Yemen. There are no shipping agent uh, companies that want to ship to Yemen because of the blockade uh, is one. They are not interested. They can, you know, their ship can stay in a Saudi port for months. Uh, so as it is, we, we are, and, and that's why we have such the world's, the world's worst humanitarian crisis in Yemen. So a designation would just be a death sentence. Uh, it, it will actually be genocide against the Yemeni people. Wow, thank you for sharing that perspective, Aisha. And I really hope that the Biden administration does not move forward with this disastrous policy. Um, I, I wanted to turn to Marcus briefly. I know we only have him for a minute or two. Specifically, uh, you know, Congress, if they invoke the War Powers Act to try to cut off spare parts, maintenance, and logistical support, I've heard some say, Okay, the War Powers Act doesn't cover that, you know, and, and they, they try to make this distinction. And I just want to hear your perspective on how the War Powers Act could be used to end ongoing forms of U.S. complicity, uh, putting aside any, uh, you know, distinctions between offensive and defensive in, in the last few minutes we have you. Yeah, well, well, this was, uh, I sort of read the text of the War Powers Act. Uh, Act verbatim uh, in my my initial comments, and uh, um, it, it kind of skated by a little bit quickly. But um, just to read it again, uh, the war powers, uh, the the definition of hostilities under under war powers includes uh, any actions taken by the U.S. to command, coordinate, participate in the movement of or accompany the regular or irregular military forces of any foreign country or government when such forces are engaged in hostilities. Uh, so, um, you, you know, the Congress, it's Congress can interpret the meaning of these terms, which are, which are very broad. Uh, there's no court decision that has ever narrowed them. This is, this is up to Congress, uh, to determine the meaning of these terms. And to me, uh, it's it's very obvious that uh, keeping the Saudi Air Force in the air, uh, <laughs> you know, literally doing the maintenance that lets them take off with U.S. personnel, counts as participating in the movement of um, military forces of a foreign country in hostilities. You, you know, it, without us, the movement wouldn't even be possible. So uh, it does seem to me that that falls within the scope of the War Powers Resolution. Thank you so much for that. And I, I know you covered it, but, you know, sometimes I, I hear from staffers like, hey, Hammer, you know, yeah. yeah, you just got to keep driving the point home that and I think you're right. Congress can interpret its own laws. So they passed uh, the 1973 War Powers Act and, uh, you know, they used the War Powers Act to end midair refueling and, you know, uh, these Saudi warplanes are sustained by fuel, by spare parts, by technical assistance, and U.S. military personnel overseeing the transfer of these spare parts and maintenance. So I think you make some really important points. Um, I, I wanted to turn to another question that we, we have here um, in the chat, and uh, how can Saudi enforce a blockade what happens if a sovereign nation sends a cargo ship of food and supplies and, and how does the blockade tactically work uh you know and let's just kind of separate it out we've got the air 
you know, no-fly zone, the closure of Sana Airport, we've also got this seaport blockade of uh, Hodeida and Salif ports. So I'll, I'll open this up to anybody that can say a little bit more about how Saudi enforces this blockade. So this gets to the point Bruce was making about the need for a, UN, a new UN Security Council resolution. So back in 2015, when the Saudi-led intervention got started, the UN agreed that it was important for the international community to help prevent smuggling of Iranian weapons into Yemen. And they established something called UNVIM, the UN Verification and Inspection Mechanism to, to look and, and check imports coming into Yemen. Um, and Bruce recently had a, an excellent piece on this where he, he points out that it's, it's kind of ridiculous because on top of this, this legitimate UN mechanism to check for smuggled weapons, we then have the Saudis imposing additional restrictions and delays on ships that are trying to get in. And so, but again, this is legitimized by UN Security Council Resolution 2216, which, which calls for the states like Saudi Arabia, member states to sort of help enforce this. And so Saudi Arabia can say, look, we're just doing what the UN said was okay back in 2015, which again is why it's so necessary for a new Security Council resolution to actually address the ways in which the terms of, of what it would take to actually start these negotiations or to lift the blockade, all of these need to be updated in a way that isn't just catered to Saudi preferences. Um, and then as Hassan mentioned, it's also an air blockade, you know, this the, the question of the air to air missiles that were sold um, or the that were allowed to be sold back in December, that's partly what is enforcing planes that that cannot land in Yemen because no, everyone knows that if they were to try to fly a plane into Yemen and, and they hadn't gotten permission from the Houthis, it would be shot out of the, or from the Saudis who control Yemen's airspace, it would be shot out of the sky. Um, so again, this notion that that was simply a defensive weapon the this this distinction between offensive defensive weapon i think everyone is buying to, into it too much because it really doesn't actually help us all that much to understand that what the saudis are doing is by definition entirely an offensive action against yemen um, and also the best way to get the houthis to stop firing missiles at the saudis would be to withdraw. We know that the Houthis had stopped firing at the UAE because the UAE had withdrawn at the on end of 2019. Although they were still involved um, mostly in, in the south part of Yemen, they were not, there were no longer many uh, Emirati troops engaged. And it was only recently that we saw the UAE escalating. Then we saw this response um, from the Houthis and they're again firing missiles at, at the UAE. So it's clear that the way forward here and to really try to, to get Yemen back to a civil war where the, the Yemenis themselves can try to work out what is going to be the power sharing agreement, what are gonna be the terms of, of Yemen's future. We need to help get that back in the hands of Yemenis. Whereas at the moment, as long as Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Iran continue to pour in these resources, the war is never going to end. Thank you so much, Anil. Um, you know, and I'll just lift up that CARE and Norwegian Refugee Council in August sent a letter talking about the airport closure and how there are 30,000 plus people that are waiting medical evacuations and mercy flights. So, you know, uh, it's also creating, uh, you know, a doubling of prices of critical metal, uh, medicines when coupled with the fuel blockade. So, this is really compounding and it's also, you know, incentivizing a lot of the, you know, the uh, access questions and, and hoarding questions that people are so concerned about inside Yemen. So you've got this, you know, you've got the blockade on the outside, you know, enforced by the Saudi led coalition, but it has all these downstream effects. Um, Bruce, I, I wanted to ask you a question about the Biden administration in particular. Uh, you know, there was a foreign policy uh, magazine op-ed, I think that just came out today, that really talked about how the National Security Council is, is playing a role in a lot of these decisions around the FTO designation, uh, and they cited Brett McGurk in particular. I was wondering uh, if you could tell us about, you know, you know, the 
Brett McGurk, if you know him as a, as a colleague, you know some of the, the role he's playing, uh, some of the role that NSC is playing as well. And uh, you know, if you could just shed a little bit more light on how these decisions are being made. Um, I, I can do that in the theory. Uh, I, I don't have access uh, to the Biden NSC. Um, uh, I'm not consulted by the Biden administration. Um, I understand why. Um, the, uh, and, and I don't know Mr. McGurk, I, I've literally met him on a Zoom uh, meeting. Um, but it does make sense that the NSC would be the place where this war uh, and American policy towards it is formulated. Um, like it or not, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are very, very important allies of the United States or partners of the United States. Um, if you want to get things done uh, in the region, uh, they are big players in getting things done. Uh, and we have complex relationships with them. Um, it, it would be too simple to give this policy wholly to the Secretary of State or wholly to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, they, these policies need to be very well coordinated uh, and operate uh, in a team-like structure. And that is, at the end of the day, what the National Security Council's uh, position is, is all about, coordination of activities so that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing at all times. I think that it, it is safe to say as well that uh, the NSC has not really been terribly involved in any kind of peace process here. Um, the the, the, the um, activity of uh, Tim Lenderking uh, does not seem to include an NSC uh, office uh, participation. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty low level Department of State uh, operation. Uh, and so far uh, has been basically shuttling back and forth around the region. Um, what would be much better to have is uh, a uh, engagement with the government in Sana'a. Uh, and, and I think Aisha's point here is very important. It is not just the Houthis. There is now a government in Sana'a that represents 80% of the Yemeni people. Um, and that, that government needs to be part of uh, the diplomatic process here in a way in which we really have never seen uh, anything like that before. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I really appreciate that analysis. I know uh, Marcus and Anel had to jump off right at two o'clock, uh, but uh, Bruce and Anel, I'd love for you to offer a final thought you know, this is uh, obviously a really, you know, heavy conversation, really important, uh, you know, urgent subject matter here. But maybe maybe we can start with uh, Bruce and then Anel to give a final word. Sure, I, I will be brief. I'll make two points. Um, not only are we going backwards, uh, but we now risk uh, going backwards disastrously in two realms. One is if we designate the FTO, uh, as Aisha said, and I think others have said, we will be aiding and abetting uh, what is in effect genocide. A genocide in a, in a horrible way through malnourishment, uh, a way in which the youngest, the most vulnerable, are the ones who are most at risk. Um, that would be a terrible mistake. The other mistake would be for the United States to now actively get involved uh, in this war. Uh, and I fear that that is precisely what the Emiratis would like the United States to do now. Make the United States troops, aircraft, and Navy uh, an active participant in the war, uh, perhaps starting the defense of Abu Dhabi. But once you start down that path, it's going to be awfully hard because the answer that anybody in the, in the missile uh, business will tell you right away, the answer to dealing with incoming missiles is not to stop them in the air, but to go to the launch site and to take action against the launch site. 
Um, that's what we did uh, in the first Gulf War. Um, that's what we did in, in other campaigns. And that means the United States is not only uh, uh, what it is today, but it's becoming even more dangerously uh, involved in this conflict. Thank you so much, Bruce. And Nell? <clears throat> I just want to echo Bruce's point, which we didn't even quite get to, which is that the, the U.S. is now increasing its escalation. And what we've observed is that U.S. service members are now at risk, uh, as we saw the, the Houthi missiles that were launched that could have potentially hit uh, a U.S. soldier station at Adafra Air Force Base. And this is why the Biden administration is is you know, might redesignate the Houthis a foreign terrorist organization. Um, but the point here being that we're not going to be able to protect our, our soldiers in the region from these kinds of missiles. Thus far, the, the systems in place have been able to deflect a lot of them. This is why we see very low casualty rates from, from Houthi attacks as compared to the the monstrous casualty rates that Yemenis experience, but it's possible that a, a, a U.S. soldier could be killed. And then would Biden go to war over this? Is this something that the American people are willing to send U.S. soldiers back into another war in the Middle East? We know from public opinion data, Americans are, are exhausted by these failed wars in the Middle East. And in general, the Biden administration just really needs to reconsider this policy of, of giving such unconditional support to the Saudis and Emiratis and instead really think here about what are U.S. interests. Um, and it is in U.S. interests to, to not be dragged into another endless war in the region, especially when we have so many other security concerns on our plates. I, I just wanted to address a couple more. I know my colleague Marcus addressed the Malinowski bill, but there's still been a couple more questions about it. And our, our point here is that Malinowski's bill, while it's great that he is drawing attention to this, it does not go far enough. It is, in fact, fairly conditional. Um, it is not clear that it would really do all that much to end U.S. support for, for what the Saudis are doing. It wouldn't really shift the status quo all that much. And so this is part of why those of us who've been working on this and have tried other legislative avenues have have concluded that a war powers resolution is really the only answer at this point because all other avenues have just not worked and to try to go through another round of the ndaa for example that failed three times um so this is part of why with this call with with uh hill staff we did want to try to make this clear there was another question asking for resources um, definitely look, look to FCNL, look, I mean, Bruce's writings at Brookings, the Quincy Institute, just um, a quick purview of, of a lot of what we've written on this, um, but also feel free to reach out um, to me. I'll put my email in the chat if people want to follow up um, with ad additional questions. Bruce, Anel, um, and Thank you so much for sharing that, you know, closing thought about the situation in Yemen, for providing all your feedback and all the great writing that you've done. Uh, you know, we really appreciate Marcus and Aisha as well for joining us. Yes, there I saw a comment in the chat. Um, you know, we will be sharing a recording and we really hope that the staffers on this call stay engaged on this issue. Uh, support a new Yemen war powers resolution, re resolution to terminate all ongoing U.S. participation in this war before it, it further escalates and uh, becomes, uh, you know, a, a more even more of a regional mess. So uh, thank you so much and uh, please keep in touch.